In the following session, we'll be discussing how the cancer community can lobby for strengthened cancer management and control in a post-COVID world. This as we all, of course, aim to build back better. To start off this session, we will revert back to France and connect again with the National Cancer Institute, this time, though, with the Director General, Thierry Breton. Um, and I believe, Thierry Breton, over to you now. As you may know, the French decennial strategy against cancer was launched by the French president on the 4th of February 2021. Over the last few decades, major advances have been made. In the early 60s, we cured one in two cancers. We are now close to two in three. But these breakthroughs do not make the death, the impact, and the suffering caused by the disease any more acceptable. In France, 3.8 million people have had or are living with cancer. We consider that the burden of cancer will increase in our country. The population is aging, and cancer is clearly a disease which affects older people. The survival rates increase, so too will the impact on people's lives. While drawing up our new strategy, we focused on one question. What can we do to improve the French population's health? And we felt that it was important to seek the, the opinions of our population, asking them the same question. What can we do to help you improve your health? We organized two citizens' consultations. The public response was significant and the lessons learned particularly useful. Based on this top-down, bottom-up analysis, we set out four goals with extremely quantified targets. Firstly, to reduce the number of preventable cancers by 60,000 per year by 2040. Secondly, to carry out an additional 1 million more screenings by 2025 using existing screening procedures. Next, to reduce the proportion of patients suffering from after effects five years after diagnosis from two thirds to one third. And lastly, to significantly improve the survival rate of cancers with poor prognosis by 2030. In, 20, in um, 2016, seven types of cancer have a five-year survival rate of less than 33%. In addition to targeting these cancers, we also aim to improve outcomes for other subtypes or stages of cancers whose progression remains very unfavorable. But if we want to make a difference, we need to change how we operate. We have conceived our new strategy according to several key guiding principles. We need to allow more time to reach more ambitious goals as changing lifestyle doesn't happen overnight. We need to act on all levers to be effective and provide faster access to more and better services. And lastly, we need to strengthen research where it is needed. Prevention is the first and most important objective of the strategy. 40% of cancer cases are preventable. Thus, reducing the burden of cancer means reducing the number of preventable cancers. Let's remember that tobacco and alcohol are the two main risk factors, and tobacco is by far our main enemy. Tobacco causes 45,000 cancer deaths annually in France, alcohol causing 16,000 by comparison. For tobacco, our objective is clear, to eliminate the population's exposure to tobacco. And to achieve this, we are implementing actions such as rising prices and helping smokers to quit. Regarding alcohol, our aim is to cut down on excessive drinking. This isn't easy, because in France there are strong cultural ties to alcohol consumption, particularly wine. But, for the first time, a national program will be adopted to reduce this risk and thereby improve the population's health. Environmental exposure proved to be a major concern during the two citizens' consultation we held. 
However, we need more data and more studies regarding the level of exposure and its self-implication. Nevertheless, while conducting this research, we are implementing initiatives to protect people, in particular with a zero exposure at school plan. Basically, we are determined to enable our fellow citizens to live in a safer environment by fostering educational activities from an early age while assisting local authorities to set up health initiatives. I know this issue is also a key concern at the European level. The second objective of the strategy is to limit sequelae and improve people's well-being by providing faster access to innovation for all, with the overall of evaluation and financing models to enable a more rapid dissemination of innovation for the benefits of more patients. Drug innovations come immediately to mind, but there are also diagnostic tests, for example. We also want to boost therapeutic de-escalation to cut down on toxicity and to prevent and manage sequelae during medical follow-up. Moreover, we want to streamline administrative procedures and to prevent patients' isolation by using digital tools. And we want to extend the right to be forgotten to every cancer survivor so that they can take out a mortgage like everyone. I understand that many European countries are interested in the right to be forgotten, and we are happy to share our experience and expertise on this. The third objective of the strategy is to combat cancers with poor prognosis. In 2016, seven types of cancer have a five-year survival rate less than 33%. Lung, pancreas, esophagus, liver, stomach, central nervous system, acute myeloid leukemia. Our objective is to boost progress by funding and accrediting international level research specializing in poor prognosis, by setting up multidisciplinary research programs and adopting a high-risk, high-gain approach to, in to increase disruptive innovations, by redesigning clinical trials to enable faster responses and emphasizing quality of life criteria, and lastly, by implementing accelerated diagnosis systems. Our fourth and last objectives aim to ensure that everyone benefits from the progress made. We are committed to tackling social and regional inequalities in health, with a particular focus on pediatrics. For example, we are create, creating a long-term follow-up scheme for people who have had cancer in childhood or adolescence, and helping young, young patients continue their education by setting up connected campuses. Finally, the French 10-year strategy plans to ensure continuity of cancer control measures even in times of crisis, based on the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, we have observed delays in treatment, particularly in surgery and post-cancer reconstruction. We suspect also that people have not attended treatment appointments. From the outset, Avoiding loss of opportunity for treatment has been a priority for everyone involved in cancer care. Since May, since May 2020, a National Cancer and COVID-19 Committee, led by the Institute in collaboration with the French Ministry of, of Health, has worked together oncology specialists on a weekly basis. This enabled us to publish organizational recommendations targeting professionals in line with local needs. This provides health professionals with a clear framework to adapt their care, taking regional characteristics into account. The lessons learned will improve readiness for the next crisis. To conclude, we are convinced that one of the keys to success is the strengthening of European and international cooperation. International cooperation offers considerable scope for progress in terms of research, prevention, screening, early diagnosis, and in access to high-quality services and innovative therapies. 
France wishes to contribute fully to accelerating progress on the European as well on the international stage. Thank you. Thierry, thank you very much uh, indeed. Let's bring in our panelists now. Uh, first off, Dr. Ned Sharpless is director of the National Cancer Institute in the United States. And then we have uh, Dr. Ana Cristina Pino Mendes Pereira, director of the National Cancer Institute in Brazil. Professor Gamal Amira is professor of surgical oncology at the National Cancer Institute of Cairo University in Egypt. And we also welcome back this time live Thierry Breton, the director of the National Cancer Institute in France. Uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, lovely to see you all and uh, also to our virtual audience as ever please send all of the questions through to the live question chat so that we can address them all in the Q&A uh, once we've heard uh, from all of our participants. Let me kick off though uh, with you Ned, Dr Ned Sharpless you are a director as I said of the National Cancer Institute in the US it's wonderful to have you here. Broadly speaking what's been the impact of COVID on, on cancer services across the US? Yeah it's been really disruptive I think uh, oh, by the way good morning everyone thank you for having me. Um, Glad to talk about this topic. It's been really disruptive. Uh, early in the pandemic, we did some modeling and predicted we were going to see a, a significant impact of the pandemic on clinical care, patients getting diagnosed with cancer, patients getting therapy for cancer, and patients getting screened for cancer. We predicted excess mortality from that, from those changes from cancer. And uh, now we have, over the last year and a half, see, seen many of those predictions come true. We've seen a devastating drop in cancer screening in the United States. At one point, mammography was down 95% for a few months in the US. We've seen a decrease in cancer diagnosis, so many patients are getting diagnosed at later stage. And we've seen people postponing their care. We've seen interruptions of surgeries and radiation therapy and chemotherapy and other, other measures. So we think that all of these things together, decreased screening, diagnosis, and treatment, are going to conspire for excess cancer deaths. Happily now, uh, I think the cancer community in the United States and internationally has come together to realize the pandemic is a serious problem for our patients and has really kind of rallied together to try and make the impact of the pandemic as least bad as possible. And we now have resumptions of screening and we've had a national leadership on this topic from various societies and recommendations about clinical care. And even the uh, president and first lady are now talking about return to screening. So I think that we are um, on the track to recovery, but uh, it's uh, clear, it's important to say that the pandemic has been very disruptive and bad for cancer care in the United States. Have there been any opportunities, perhaps even positives, that have come out of the pandemic that, that you could draw upon and, and, and lean on further through cancer services? Certainly there have been some positives. You know, this immense public health tragedy has, uh, you know, changed the way we do things in, in cancer care and clinical care. And and, and some of those uh, learnings we will we will hope to preserve after the pandemic is long gone. For example, you know, this broad adoption of care by by Zoom chat and telehealth and uh, WebEx that, that has been very uh, successful in many ways, and patients really like it, the caregivers like it. So I, I think that's been an important adjustment. We've worked with regulatory agencies like the FDA, like how do we do clinical trials differently in a pandemic? And many of those changes have been very very popular. Uh, for example, the ability to consent people by phone or mail investigational drugs. So you're making clinical trials easier to do and cheaper to do and, and better for patients, we think is, is something we've learned. We've really focused on, on uh, you know, learning from every patient and sharing data. And that, that's something we were doing before the pandemic. But I think many of the things about the pandemic have forced us to step up our data architecture, if you will, the ability to aggregate data and use it across platforms. And so those are a few examples, but I, I think there's just many, many other things that we've changed, the way, changed the way we've been doing business for the pandemic that will persist beyond the pandemic for the good of patients. Ned, we hear this phrase, build back better. We hear it across politics and in, in every aspect of life at the moment. What does build back better really mean when it comes to cancer? Right, well, so uh, and one other thing I think is important to say, by the way, is that during this period, cancer research has gone pretty well. So we've been able to disperse funds and our scientists have been able to work. And so the science of cancer is advancing at this rapid pace, as we heard in the prior speaker, and, and we expect that to continue. And, and so there's this opportunity now to build back better, to use those learnings of cancer biology and cancer care and apply them to patients as we recover from the disruptive uh, effects of, of the pandemic on cancer care, but really take better care of our patients, to diagnose cancer better and earlier, to prevent cancer using modalities, to have better therapies when patients do get cancer, and to have a better survivorship, better quality of life after treatment when uh, patients are diagnosed. So we think that these are all opportunities to build back better with regard to cancer care in the United States. 
Ned, uh, thank you. Stand by. Uh, but appreciate your time for, for the time being, Doc, Dr. Sharpless. Let me turn, though, to Dr. Ana Cristina Pino Mendes Pereira, who's director of Brazil's National Cancer uh, Institute. Um, I, if you are still with us, you are. Wonderful. I was just checking I had you in the screen. Uh, nice to see you, Doctor. Um, talk to us first off about the impact of COVID on uh, the cancer patients and the can uh, cancer landscape in Brazil. Well, uh, of course, as we all know, COVID-19 represents uh, for one and a half year, one of the greatest threats to global health as well as in Brazil, of course. As the World Health Organization pointed out, we've suffered not only the impact of uh, casualties, but also the great negative consequences for mental health. That was a very important aspect in, in our country. Isolation and economic depression paved the way to the increase of anxiety and the consumption of junk food, alcohol, and tobacco, which are all risk factors for cancer. In, in parallel, due to unemployment, many citizens moved from the private health system to the public system, putting even more pressure on available resources. In order to comply with isolation restrictions and in order to promote mass vaccination against COVID-19, resources, hostel supplies, and workforce were partly directed to this end. Therefore, other annual vaccination campaigns such as HPV for cervical cancer and other prevention programs like screening and diagnosis in charge of primary and secondary care levels were totally impacted. Um, likewise, surgeries due to pre-op COVID testing and fear of patients, chemotherapy and radiotherapy treatments had to be postponed, as has already been mentioned, besides the need to treat cancer patients who presented with COVID-19. So, and also the global impact of the disease restricted the provision of medical supplies in general, added to the appreciation of dollar the government had an even greater challenge to provide these essential goods to fight the pandemic and promote health in all its areas, including oncology. So all these factors negatively impacted the functioning of the public and private health systems, for sure. But due to the efforts of the government and healthcare professionals, um, our, our numbers were not as bad as we thought it would be initially. Mm. Oh, well, that's interesting and, and good to hear that, that it wasn't as bad as you as you thought. Um, but I'm wondering then which strategies in particular would you say worked well when you were trying to reach cancer patients? Well, first of all, we've chosen some um, key and, and, and kind of obvious um, macro strategies uh, like establishing priorities and fast track flows based on technical criteria, because this means equity respect the existence evidence-based protocols concerning screening, diagnosis, treatment, including palliative care. Uh, also, the optimization of the use of resources and technological incorporation and guaranteeing that they are totally cost effective because uh, no time for um, and no money for adventures. Also, the raising of aware in the awareness on the financial impact of litigation processes over health manager, management. And also a very important strategy was the, the massive information campaigns that were held by the government uh, about the safety of um, cancer treatments, the importance of uh, not, it, the, not interrupting these treatments because we think this was very, that made a huge difference. So we had a major impact on cancer surgery, uh, a decrease in almost 16%, but we had a, a small increase in chemotherapy and radiotherapy, but perhaps because one explanation for that was that many patients that were eligible for surgery they missed the chance of being operated and they had to go to, to chemo and radiotherapy. But okay. some other remarkable actions were like a, um, a shift towards scientific production on COVID-19 like with cancer patients, because this is a new field of knowledge 
what is the behavior of COVID in cancer patients, uh, the expansion of isolation rooms and adaptation of, of institutional protocols within the same structures. Right. Review uh, some dynamics in the Institute, like home office, efficient, more efficient meetings, and new sources of connectivity with patients and within the institution, like the Inca app, the in and some warehouse, some apps created to improve communication with patients. Okay. And with the help of some and with the help of some innovations like telemedicine, e-training and experience exchange, specialized online support to primary health care, and humanized approach through virtual visit. And we think these changes will be will become permanent. Well, thank you very much for outlining that, um, Dr. Pino Mendez Pereira, and uh, please do stand by as well for the Q&A uh, towards the end of the session. But I want to uh, turn my attention now to Professor Gamal Amira, who is Professor of Surgical Oncology with Cairo University's National Cancer Institute in uh, Egypt. Professor, it's good to see you. Um, talk us through then the, the situation in Egypt right now regarding COVID-19, the pandemic, and the effect that that has had on cancer services in the country. It's actually last year, uh, we were affected like many other countries by the start of the pandemic. And of course, at that time, the number of operations dropped and the number of admissions were decreased. This was during the summer time between uh, uh, May and September uh, 2020. But after that, we started to uh, reach the usual number of uh, operations. Still, we have uh, limitations in admission, but we uh, increased the centers which do uh, cancer operations. We uh, used this time to uh, uh, build new cancer centers, and the National Cancer Institute is now uh, making a new institute which will have 60 operating theaters and 1,000 beds. So uh, we were working. Uh, uh, in advance, expecting the improvement in the condition as it is now. There is a drop in the cases. There is uh, more admissions. And I think we almost return it to the usual numbers. We perform about, uh, we have performed about 1,700 cases in the NCI uh, this year in uh, eight months. And I think this is the usual. So I think yeah. we are returning back to the normal. Well, that, that's very good to hear. And in the development of new facilities that you outlined before, would you say that's been the focus of your cancer initiatives across the country? Yes, there are many initiatives, including all health services, uh, including uh, virus C that was endemic in Egypt. And there was a presidential initiative started uh, uh, 2018 for eradication of this disease. And they have screened 45 million persons and about 10% uh, uh, of them, 8% of them had the disease and they have received the drugs freely. And in next year, we will declare Egypt free of uh, virus C that you used to cause a lot of cases of hepatocellular carcinoma that was on top of cancer in male populations in Egypt in the last 10 years. We are going to eradicate this disease. And of course, this will help us to uh, change the resources to other cancers. Also, we have a presidential initiative for women health as uh, uh, obesity, treatment of anemia, and treatment of cancer, especially cancer breast. They have started with breast cancer screening and they have screened about 26 million females in three stages. And we have uh, done about uh, 90,000 mammograms and about 8,000 biopsies. 4,000 right. of them had breast cancer and they were uh, found in an earlier stages than before. So there was drop of advanced cases by 50%. And the, these patients receive treatment freely in many cancer centers and in many hospitals. And the list of breast cancer patients is dropping markedly. 
and we hope that this uh, initiative will extend to uh, body uterus and cervical carcinoma and other cancers in uh, 2030. It's certainly really impressive progress, um, and thank you for outlining that. I'm, what, what's Egypt's approach going to be in, in moving towards universal health coverage? Uh, of course, we have limitations in the resources, but now we are going to do an, uh, a system for the uh, insurance for the whole population. And it is, will be covered in 10 years, 30% uh, will be covered by the contribution of the workers and the employment uh, places, and 30% will be covered by the uh, budget of the Republic, and about 35% will be covered by the taxes, which will be done on uh, cigarettes, alcohol, and other uh, services, uh, sure to uh, decrease the uh, uh, problems for yeah. low and low socioeconomic people who yeah. cannot and who do not have insurance, but the government is going to cover all people with insurance in 10 years, and they have started it already in two governorates, one in the North Port side on Suez Canal, and one in the South Luxor governorate. They have started early this year and they are achieving good progress. And I anyway. think it will extend on six steps to cover all governments of Egypt. Again, it's very it's impressive and, and really promising as well, what you've just outlined there as far as UHC is, is concerned. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Amira. I'm going to turn back now to um, Thierry Breton. Uh, Thierry, we heard from you earlier, um, and it's wonderful to have you uh, live now with us uh, at this World Cancer Leaders Summit. Um, you're the director of the National Cancer Institute in France. So, how do we maintain cancer activities through a pandemic, through a, a global crisis, especially activities such as screening, which we've heard so much about? Um, thank you for inv inviting me and uh, uh, giving me the chance to take part of this uh, very interesting panel. Uh, maybe we have something to different things to do, and we have to learn, of course, of the COVID-19 pandemic. But I, I would say that uh, we have to... Uh, uh, implement very strong and tough procedures to uh, avoid any kind of uh, um, uh, spreadness of uh, COVID-19 or other um, infectious disease. Uh, it's, a, it's very important. And in France, uh, we have, uh, I think we have learned about uh, the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, about this kind of procedures uh, in order that uh, tomorrow when we uh, must deal with uh, the next probably uh, pandemic, we, we will be able to maintain the screening programs. Uh, actually, we, we have uh, we suspended it. Uh, we have in France two screening programs about breast, colorectal, and uh, cervical cancers. And we have uh, we suspended it, uh, suspended them uh, during three, three months. Uh, so, um, it's uh, next time we'll be able, I think, to maintain this, uh, uh, this screening program with this new procedure. It's very important. And unfortunately, we have uh, observed, but uh, uh, our other colleagues uh, um, observe the same thing I've, in, I've, uh, actually in their, in their country, that uh, uh, some of the patients uh, or some of the participants have uh, postponed, put off their right. treatment right. and there is a, um, I, I, we fear that there is there a huge, uh, uh, a huge um, um, stake uh, to take into account. Yeah, and that was going to be my next question, actually, which is really how do you tackle then that fear that so many people have about uh, turning up for appointments in the middle of a pandemic? So many people are going to be putting off those sort of routine appointments as well, be it screening or anything else. So how do you go about um, calming people's fears? But we we tried uh, to um, communicate hugely, massively, uh, to explain that procedures uh, are strong and uh, uh, that patient could could uh, appoint uh, their treatment appointment uh, with um, safely. Uh, but I think in the first part of the pandemic, the fear was so important 
uh, that even with a massive campaign of information sensibilization, uh, patients uh, has deci decided to, to put off their, their, their treatment uh, and uh, deciding to wait uh, just uh, just few months. But it could have of obviously uh, dramatic consequences. So I, I think uh, next time we will have to um, to, to maintain uh, an information campaign very very ma massive, very uh, very important. But we we have to uh, uh, to to uh, make new tools or new ideas to uh, uh, to inform the patients and to yes. uh, make sure that they will go to their treatment appointment, maybe by mobilization uh, of health professionals and the entire health sector. Thierry, thank you very much. And I want to welcome back all of the panellists now uh, as we go to the Q&A, because we have had a lot of questions coming in from, from our audience. So um, bear with me as I get to as many of them as possible. And first question, uh, Ned, to you, uh, Dr Sharpless, and perhaps, Anna, I'll come to you with this as well afterwards. Um, one uh, participant said, it saddens me to hear that more people are presenting with later stage cancers. How can we all get behind healthcare systems as they tackle that? Ned, to you first. Right. I think the, um, as I said, we have to be frank and admit this is going to happen. I mean, the modeling is very clear. We think this will play out over a decade. It won't be a six-month type phenomena. We've largely seen a resumption of screening in the United States, but not completely. We're still down a bit from where we are. And importantly, we think we missed on the order of 10 million screening events. So it's going to be hard to make up. So I, I think really the right thing to do at this time is to say this is a problem. We all share in a solution to this problem, and, and collectively, the doctors, the caregivers, the scientists, the politicians, the policy leaders, everyone who thinks about cancer is interested in cancer and pays for cancer care in the United States has to acknowledge this problem and do everything possible to get, uh, get to, to, to right the ship, if you will. So we uh, have launched educational campaigns, and we, we've heard about those in other countries, and I, we believe that's a, a, an effective way to try and ameliorate the problem. We've had, for example, the first lady in the United States, Dr. Biden, is talking a lot about return to screening, and we think her advocacy has been very, very helpful. So I was with her in South Carolina yesterday talking about this, and we saw a mobile mammography unit that will go out into the community and screen patients that way and try and sort of try and make up the deficit. So we have to be creative and innovative and nimble to try and make the impact of the pandemic as, as minimal on our patients as we can. And lastly, we have to hope that this innovation and these great new ideas that are coming through in cancer care, that they can, they can help make up for some of the later stage diagnosis. So in lung cancer, for example, we now see the ability to cure a lot of patients who used to be incurable even 10 years ago. So innovation can sort of make up for some of that later stage uh, diagnosis, but we think that is going to happen and we need to take collective action to minimize the impact. Anna, let me put this question to you. Um, how can we ensure that pandemic preparedness for cancer control is included in national cancer control plans, say, for example, in Brazil? Well, in Brazil, we have a national policy on cancer control. It is quite well established. Uh, what lacks is more articulation, more organization at among the different the different instances of this of the policies so we have we have to to interconnect more um, in a better way primary care secondary care and the tertiary level of care but i think one basic strategy as i mentioned is uh, to respect the already existing evidence-based protocols on screening diagnosis and treatment which means we need to we need to screen who is who has to be screened to to diagnose who has to be diagnosed respecting the the time the time frame between exams um, the, the the age uh, of, of screening so I think we if we do what is already predicted we will be helping a lot and also to. To, to improve communication with society and with, pri with especially primary care providers, mm -hmm. um, ensuring the importance of keeping up with the programs and, um, and with the help of, of the different levels of governments, 
uh, we can we can really organize the system in a better way so it becomes more efficient. I have a question which really goes to all four of you, and if I can, I can ask you all to, to respond uh, relatively briefly because time is against us. Um, but do all of you directors believe that an outcome of the pandemic will be a change in the government's views on investing more in national health uh, in the future? Um, perhaps if I can come to you first on that, Professor Amira, do you think that Egypt's government will, in, will have a different view on investing in national health as a result of COVID-19? I think we, the government started that before the appearance of the pandemic. There is more interest in the uh, increasing the budget of health and budget of education because they used to be low in the budget of the country. So they started in 2018 to increase the budget for uh, virus three uh, control and then for cancer control. And this uh, uh, helped a lot to almost eradicate the virus C and to increase the cancer service all over the country by increasing the number of cancer centers, increasing the uh, uh, equipment, increasing the uh, uh, screening. And okay. I think they are going to the right track, uh, hopefully. OK, thank you very much, Professor Amira. Um, Anna, let me come back to you uh, on that point, uh, whether you think that Brazil's government will perhaps change tact. Brazilian government already invests a, a huge amount of money each year in the health system. But I think we need more, we need more efficiency, more efficiency instead of more money. Of course, uh, COVID has dragged a huge amount of, of money that will now be used back into um, like the, the control national program. But um, I think we need more um, efficiency in the using of these um, okay. financial resources. And, and the government is working on that okay. with the partnership of the National Cancer Institute, which is in charge of, uh, of the the articulation of these actions all over the country. Thank you. Uh, Thierry, to you now. Um, same question and the response of the French government. Yeah, the French government has, has decided to, to increase funding of uh, the national health system, and particularly uh, in the hospital uh, just after the start of the pandemic. So um, with uh, a new kind of measure and financial measure to, to help and to strengthen the, the hospital. Uh, and regarding uh, the cancer control plan, our president uh, has uh, set up the new decennial French strategy and, uh, um, he, uh, and the, in, in, the same, uh, in the same way, uh, he has decided to uh, increase the funding of cancer control plan by uh, 240 million euros okay. uh, for the next five, five years. Um, it's an increase, yep. so it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a good measure for us. Okay, thank you. And, and Ned, if I can come to you lastly and, and briefly, because we are very much out of time, uh, but the, the same uh, question to you on the US. Yeah, you know, President Biden has said very forcefully that ending cancer as we know it is a top domestic priority. And I, I think he's really, this administration is fully committed to making good on that. And that, that means more funding for cancer research and biomedical research in general. And that means a more, more, more support for the care of patients with cancer. And certainly we're having a very lively discussion in the United States at present in Congress about funding for both of those. And I suspect we will see increased funding for both care and for science in the future. Well, my thanks to all of our panelists for that fascinating discussion. Thank you for sparing the time at this summit. Uh, we are going to take a short break now. Um, and also, it's time for you, our audience, to connect with each other uh, whilst we're on this break. You can do that online. Don't forget also to check the summit's sponsors. Uh, their profiles are on the platform as well. I'll see you soon.